The McCannum wheel is such a strange looking device and yet it's one of the most oddly satisfying things to watch in motion. The first time I saw one of these, believe it or not, was on a forklift. It was so surprising to see this thing tracking sideways like a crab and smoothly at that. I felt like I was watching Michael Jackson moonwalking. It's just the unnatural weirdness of it that this doesn't feel right and yet it's so satisfying to watch is exactly the experience I had. I wanted to know how does it move like that? In order to really understand how the McCannum wheel works, we need to see it from the bottom. And that's why I've got this camera set up right down here. What we're gonna do is give you a view from underneath. I've got a remote control card that I've put together. We've got some McCannum wheels. Let's take this step by step and see if we can figure out how we can get all these weird motions from this interesting tire design. Let's get started. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with just one wheel. Turn on the lights. Ah, isn't that beautiful? Focus on this wheel here. We're gonna spin this wheel forward. This is the front of the vehicle. Let's see what happens when we tell this wheel to go forward. Hmm, okay. It doesn't wanna go forward. It actually wants to go kind of forward and uh, towards the inside of the vehicle. Okay, before we go to two wheels, I wanna point out that the orientation of the wheel actually matters a lot here. First of all, looking at this vehicle from the top, you can see that this points down and towards the center of the car, like that. But if you look at it from the bottom, even though it feels weird looking at it from the top, I know it's actually pointing in this direction, like this, right? Right, that way. All right, so let's try the left-hand version of the wheel now it should be pointed more like this in and towards the inside of the car. Whereas from the top, as you can see, it's uh, yeah, like that. All right, here we go. We're gonna spin this wheel forward. This is the front of the vehicle and uh, what happens? Okay, so, so far we've learned that the wheel definitely wants to track along the axis of the roller. Because the wheel is free to rotate along this axis, it slips a little bit in that axis, but it's got full traction in this direction. And so without any of the wheels to uh, add any other forces, it's going to wanna to follow that line of traction. Okay, let me put the correct wheel along here because I actually want an X pattern. And let's try it with two wheels. So looking at it from the top, you can see the rollers point towards the inside of the vehicle like an X and from the bottom. All right, so what happens when we have two wheels going forward? How about two wheels going backwards? So here's where things get interesting. When there's only one wheel on the vehicle, the vehicle will tend to track along the axis of the roller that's in contact with the ground. But when you combine the two, they go straight. Why is that? Well, if we look at the direction of the forces that the car, each wheel wants to push, we can see that some of the force is actually being canceled out. The way we do that in physics is we will take a force vector, the line in which the, the force is acting on, and we divide it up into X and Y coordinates so it's a little bit easier to see where the energy is going. In this case, you can see that each wheel has a force pointing in and a force pointing forward. Well, the two forces pointing in are equal, and they cancel each other out. It's like adding five and then subtracting five, you get zero force in this direction, but you still have all the force going forward and therefore you get forward motion. But the clever part is you can decide which forces to cancel out by deciding which direction you rotate the wheels. Let me show you this. If we put the two wheels on the same side, like so, now we can track sideways like a crab. Let me show you. Isn't that cool? Look at that. Tracking in. <laughs> when they roll the same speed, it works well. And tracking out. And because we have four wheels, we can double that force and get them all to work together. Now there's, there are other motions you can create as well. You can make it spin on its own axis. You can make it pivot left and right. There's all sorts of cool things that can happen. Uh, just by spinning the wheels in different orientations. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Now, just like everything else in engineering, there are pros and cons. 
So the point that I'm trying to make here is we're not going to throw away all the traditional wheels and start putting these much more expensive and costly uh, wheel designs on our vehicles just so that they can track sideways. But when those features are important to you, you add them. And that's the part that makes engineering so fascinating. I have the opportunity to explore all of these different options. I love how we come up with all these clever ideas to meet these unique applications to get the best possible performance every time. Now you can just look at this wheel and tell that it's gonna require more maintenance, it's gonna be more expensive, and it's more complicated to make. So when would you use something like this? As we mentioned earlier, there's some pros and cons, maneuverability being the major one. And the first thing that comes to mind is the application I showed you earlier, which is the forklift. Forklifts need to be able to maneuver in very tight spaces. They move very slowly, which is another limitation of this. You don't want to use this in a high speed application, but in a warehouse setting where employees are walking around and you're moving very heavy loads, you want to move slowly anyway. So again, the speed is a good application. The maneuverability is extremely important to you to be able to stuff as much inventory into as tiny a space as possible. You need a forklift that can lift something very heavy and also get into those tight spaces. That's when it makes sense to get something like this. Another application where we see a lot of mechanic wheels will be robotics in controlled environments. And in, when I say controlled environments, in this case, I mean there's smooth, consistent flooring like a, a hospital floor or a factory floor, a warehouse where you've got paved concrete everywhere. Because the mechanic wheel has limited traction by design, allowing it to have maximum maneuverability, you also need ideal flooring conditions. But a hospital is a great example of that, right? You want to be able to move medication or uh, supplies around a hospital with a mobile robot. A mechanic wheel is a fantastic example of fitting that application. In this kind of environment, you'd wanna have sensors that let you know when you are about to run into an obstacle, whether that obstacle is a moving patient, hospital staff, it could be gurneys or uh, carts in the hallway. And so maneuverability is extremely important. You wanna be able to sense those obstacles and maneuver in whatever way possible to get around it. So a mechanic wheel is a fantastic example of meeting that need. And again, we're gonna be making some trade-offs, but those trade-offs are worth it to get this kind of benefit. So in summary, you'd wanna consider the mechanic wheel and applications where maneuverability was of the utmost importance. The wheel can be a little bit more expensive because you need to get into tight spaces. You've got ideal flooring conditions. You're not gonna be climbing stairs or anything like that. This is a robot that can roll into an elevator just fine, maneuver along uh, flat, predictable flooring just fine. Now, I wouldn't consider this wheel to be very precise because by design it can slip, but it doesn't mean you can't use it in precision applications. For example, you could have a robot arm on top of a mechanic wheel based base Maneuver into position, it won't be the perfect position, but it'll be very close. And then your robot arm may have a camera or some other means of detecting its distance to the object, reach out, grasp it, whatever the task is. And so your precision doesn't have to be relied upon the, the wheels themselves. It's all about how you design the robot. And that's why I'm so intrigued with this because I'm currently trying to design a robot that I can use as a teaching tool to get people excited about robotics. Now, we're not talking about a robot like this. Like this was way too hard. It required every bit of knowledge and skill that I had and all of that skill and knowledge was stressed to its absolute limit across many disciplines. That's not something you want to get people to try and do when you want them to, to learn something new. So my goal is to design a couple of different robots actually. I want to do like a very easy version and a little bit harder version to try to get a lot of people excited about robotics and I wanna walk you through those steps. But this is a challenge for me, I'm still figuring it out. I haven't uh, worked out all the details, but I do know that the cool factor for me <laughs> with the mechanic wheel is quite high, which is a pro I haven't mentioned so far. But don't underestimate the cool factor when you're trying to get people excited about something. Don't forget, Michael Jackson made a heck of a lot of money with his moonwalk, and I think I can get a lot of more people interested in robotics if I'm using something like a mechanic wheel. So uh, why not design my teaching robot with, with a mechanic wheel base. It's not because I'm going for a specific application, it's because I want people to be excited about robotics. I'm gonna make an easier version of this robot so that it's approachable with people who have minimal tools and minimal experience, 
but we can get you started. And then I plan to make a more difficult version, which those who maybe know a little bit about machining or, or welding or they're trying to explore those areas, these parts will be a little more challenging. But trying to build two robots at the same time is gonna require a lot of effort. And that's why I need PCBWay to help me to, they're gonna manufacture some of the parts for me. In fact, last year I had this exact same problem. I was working on a huge project called Doctor Who. There's a whole video about it if you wanna see it. Uh, I'm sure you haven't seen it because I can look at the view count and know <laughs> you haven't seen that video. But I can tell you that uh, that was one of the most challenging large scale builds I've ever made. And PCBWay printed these giant resin prints. I couldn't get anybody else to make this except them. They came through for me in a huge way. And so I enjoy working with them. They also, of course, make PCBs. They do sheet metal work. They do CNC machining. In fact, I had to replace the faceplate on Jarvis in an incident we won't be discussing here. <laughs> but anyway, all I did was send them the 3D model. They machined it, sent me the part. Everything was good and I was back in business. Now you're gonna hear more from PCB way later in the series because they're gonna be making parts for me. But I did wanna tell you before the bills even begin, if you are looking to get some custom parts made, check out PCB way, I'll put a link in the description for you. Okay, so final piece of business is we need to make some decisions about what we're gonna do with this robotics project. I need to figure out a budget. I'm trying to decide what are people comfortable paying? Like if you had to spend $150 on supplies, would that get more people involved than say if you had to spend $250? I mean, I know, you know, on a sliding scale, the lower the number, the more people can do it. But there's some threshold where we lose out on capability, right? You know, the more money we're willing to spend, the more capable the robot, the less we spend, the more people we can get involved. But you know, what's the difference between 150 and 200? Would that really change the number of people who were serious about making a robot? I don't know. Help me figure this out. I have no idea. I'm not even married to the idea that we have to use the mechanic wheel for the base, but you have to admit the cool factor is pretty high, right? So anyway, uh, it's a really clever, interesting thing to see. And I hope to use that to draw more people to robotics. That's what my real goal is. I need you guys to help me to figure out the rest. <laughs> Thanks for watching.